Good morning, church. Good morning. Amen. Uh, let's begin with a prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, gather together once again this first day of the week and uh, praise you in song and uh, pray together, encourage one another, uh, learn from your word, be encouraged by it, and uh, just enjoy the blessings of fellowship. Thank you so much, Father. And um, I thank you for your church here that uh, has just surrounded Andy and I uh, with your love uh, over many years uh, with mom's illness and decline. And uh, so many here who served us and served her. And I thank you for this great church of yours here, Father. And I pray that you continue to inspire it and guide it and fill it with your spirit and use it to reach all the many lost uh, around us. And we thank you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, please open your Bible, or uh, I suppose we'll be seeing it up here on the screen in a minute, to Matthew 25, beginning in verse 31. Matthew 25, verse 31. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And He will set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was sick. I was a stranger. I, I, I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison, and we came to you? And the king will answer them and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. And then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't take me in, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick in prison, and we didn't minister to you? And he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Powerful passage. One of the uh, rare times in which Jesus paints a picture of what the judgment day is going to be like. And it's a real clear, stark picture, isn't it? And one that maybe is kind of surprising. Because he doesn't talk about people being saved or lost, welcomed into the kingdom, or sent down into eternal punishment based on their doctrinal beliefs, based on positions that they held, based on a lot of things that we tend to think are real important, 
And I'm not saying they're not, and I'm not saying they don't have their value, okay? Please don't misunderstand me. But he's focusing here on what people did and what they did for the needy around them. That's, that's Jesus. That's not me. It's not Dennis. It's not my opinion, not my idea, not my interpretation. It's pretty obvious right there. That's what it's all about. Now, doctrinal beliefs, uh, theology, your interpretation of Scripture, what we believe, what we hold to, those things are all important. And in some ways, looking at a passage like this, that is what moves us to reach out to lost people because we see lost people all around us who don't know Christ, who don't believe in Him, who haven't repented of their sins. And to repent of your sins, we need to know what sin is. And we find that in Scripture. Who haven't been baptized, who haven't turned their life over to Christ, all of those things are part of doctrine and teaching. So, yes, we need that, obviously. But there's a very clear separation here amongst the saved and the lost, and the focus is on what people did for the needy around them. Verse 32, uh, and just, just so we're clear on who we're seeing here in this, this assembly, these, do, these two columns of people assembled before the throne... Verse 32, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. So there's not, there, there isn't like a category over here for preachers, missionaries, elders, and then there's the regular church members, and then there's all the lost. Okay? There's only two groups. You're in one group or the other. You're saved or you're lost. You're on the left or on the right. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on his right hand. Again, he's not, when he talks about uh, feeding people when they're hungry, giving people something to drink when they're thirsty, visiting the sick, visiting those in prison. Again, he's not separating a special category over here of church workers, of super Christians, of super dedicated disciples. And then there's all the rest of us. It's all one group that he's addressing. And my understanding is his expectation of this one group of the saved is that all of us are supposed to be involved in these things. Not just church leaders, church workers, uh, supported missionaries, or whatever. All of us are supposed to be involved in these things. And then, verse 37, then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? This, the righteous here is not super Christians, church leaders, preachers, elders, missionaries. The righteous is the saved, all of the saved, all of those who are in Christ. And so I ask you, do you plan to be among the saved on that day? Do you hope to be part of that group? Because if you do what Jesus is saying to this group, you fed me when I was hungry, you visited me when I was in need, you helped me, you served me. He's not talking about a special category of Christians. He's talking to all Christians, all of the saved. And Jesus has given you some real straightforward clues on how to be among the saved on that day. Helping needy people. And yes, that includes people who need to know about the gospel, people who are in error about their doctrine. Yes, it includes those people. About the need to believe and repent and be baptized and start following Jesus. Those people are included in that group. They need to know. But it also includes people who are hungry, thirsty, sick, in prison, maybe in jail, Maybe in a nursing home or a wheelchair or imprisoned in a sick, broken body. Here's an interesting detail you might never have noticed. Back in verse 37, the people ask, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? 
And Jesus doesn't answer, oh, you saw me in this and this situation. He jumps right into what they did. Verse 40, Jesus answers, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. For Jesus, uh, seeing is doing. You see a need, you meet it. You see people needing, hurting, lost, distant from Christ, you go help them. You lead them to him. That's what you do. That's what a Christian does. They don't just see and go, oh, I'll pray for that person. Praying's good. Yeah, it's good. But our duty, our responsibility doesn't stop there. I mean, I've known some people that I've reached out to and tried to share my faith with and got rebuffed and pushed away. Well, I'll pray for those people. But I'm not going to stop trying to share my faith with other people just because I got frustrated one or two times. And it's been more than one or two times. <laughs> it happens, okay? There's a lot of people out there, and it, the number seems to be growing, that don't want to know anything about Christ. But there's also a lot of people out there who don't have anything against Christ. It's just that nobody ever invited them to church. Nobody ever got close and said when, when they were talking about their mother being in sick and in the hospital and saying, would you like to pray? And, and then maybe following up with a phone call later and saying, how's your mom? Uh, is there a way I can visit her or do you need anything? And as you start to reach out to people and offer help, they begin to get impressed with the fact that somebody cares. And then eventually, somewhere down the line, they might even go, you're different. Uh, what, wh where does this come from? You know? And maybe along the way, you invite them to church or a home Bible study or share a little tract or a passage from Scripture with them. Plant some seeds. God will grow it. Helping needy people is what it's all about. They never saw Jesus hungry or thirsty. But they saw his loved ones. They saw souls that were precious to Jesus. That's what they saw. But specifically, who did they see? Well, they saw ordinary people like you and I see, but people in need, in need of food, in need of shelter, maybe in need of the gospel. Maybe that young man at the checkout, at the grocery store, or the mechanic that works on your car, uh, maybe they're not hungry, they're not thirsty, they're not in jail, but just from talking to them, you know that they, they don't go to church anywhere, and really that's the case with most people nowadays. And so there's a lot of people around us that we're in contact with on a day-to-day -day basis who don't have Christ in their lives anywhere. I mean, they, they have kind of maybe a distant belief God exists, and, and when they were kids they went to church with grandma maybe, but they're not with Christ today and they're going to be on that left hand side on that judgment day when you're over on the right and you see them over there and you think I could have said something why didn't I so they saw ordinary people like you and I see checking out of the grocery store um, getting parts in an auto parts store, buying something at Walmart. Why did they see them? Because they had their eyes open. And so I ask you, brethren, do you see all the people around you who are without Christ? Do you see the needy? Do you see the lost? Do you really see them? A number of years ago, um, before I was getting into the, uh, the mission work that I do nowadays, which is mostly with homeless people and um, people with chemical dependency, drugs and alcohol, I read a little book by uh, actually a Belgian missionary 
who had been living in Brazil for a number of years, and um, he said something that really struck me about how the poor and homeless, homeless are like at the bottom rung of the poor, nobody wants to see them. And, and it, that opened my eyes to the fact that, and, and it's, I realize it's kind of, maybe it's kind of hard for you to visualize this because in Brazil, you know, we have cars and public transportation, all that other stuff, but a lot of people, we walk, we walk a lot. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I live in the downtown area. I walk quite a bit uh, down there, and there's a lot of other people walking on the street. And, and then you see homeless people or maybe a sick person close to a hospital. They got a colostomy bag, and their intestines hanging out, and they got their hand out on the sidewalk. You see people all the time begging, asking for help. You see these needy people. And I, I've observed, and, and what... Mr. Comblain said is so true. There's basically two different kinds of people who walk past a needy person with their hand out. Uh, there's the people who will stop and, you know, fish some change out of their pocket and, and put it in the hat or the purse or just on top of the rolled up newspaper that they've got there and then walk on. And then there's the majority of the rest of the folks who all of a sudden there's something interesting up in the sky or, you know, a building or the trees or what, And it's like they just don't see them. They become invisible. And, and, it's, and I've talked with homeless people and poor people about this, and it's really true. And it's a real dehumanizing experience that your, your fellow human beings... When they see you at a distance, they act like you're not there. And over a period of time, it's like you begin to feel like you're not there, like you're not real, like you don't count. And so I learned a lot about seeing from um, Mr. Comblain. And I've noticed that it's, uh, I, I mean, I've, I realized that I myself did it also. Um, I didn't like to think about the fact that uh, people who were around me and that I was in contact with all the time, a lot of those people were lost. And so it was easier to just kind of put that out of my mind and focus on, you know, um, the bottle of aspirin that I went in the store to buy, the pharmacy, or the head of lettuce that I went in the grocery store to buy, or, you know, focus on what I was doing and not think about the fact that probably a lot of the people around me don't have Christ, they're not with Christ, and they're not going to be with Christ for eternity. And then there's all the other needy people and, and their needs and how distant they are for him. They're hurting people all around us now more than ever. Who is going to see them? Who is going to reach out to them? Who is going to invite them to church? Or just take a moment to pray with them? Or maybe take them some food? Who is going to do that? Carrie's not there with you. Bill's not there with you. Andy's not there with you. And... I could go on and name, you know, a number of other people here, but who's there? It's you. <laughs> God put you in that situation. Do you see? Are you seeing the need? And are you letting God touch your heart about it? Because you're the one that he put there. Not a preacher, not an elder, not a deacon, not anybody official representing the church. He put you there. So if you don't see them, chances are pretty good nobody else connected with the church is going to see them either. And so they're going to go unseen. They're going to remain lost. Their needs are not going to be met. And they're going to be in that left-hand column on the judgment day. And where does that leave you if you're not seeing and you're not doing what Jesus tells us, he expects the saved to be seeing and doing.
Back in verses 37 through 40, again, the people ask, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? And Jesus answered, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. For Jesus, the important thing wasn't that just that they saw the needy, the poor, the lost. The important thing was that they did something about it. What are you doing for the needy around you? What are you doing about it? You're not a preacher. You're not an evangelist, you're not an elder, you're not a deacon, you've never been to ministry school, you haven't, don't have any training, you don't have any real experience, you're shy, you're introverted, you don't know what to say, you're scared they might ask something about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and then how would you reply and stuff like that. And so we just kind of, you know, try to take care of ourselves and not make any missteps or stumbles or fall back into that habitual sin or something. And so we focus on taking care of ourselves, hopefully headed toward that judgment day. Wake up call. Read Matthew 25. <laughs> Jesus is saying, it ain't just about you taking care of yourself and you remaining righteous. You want to be considered righteous on that day? What were you doing about the needs of others around you while you were here? This is everybody's responsibility. Jesus wasn't addressing a group of super Christians, a group of, uh, you know, church leaders or whatever, he was speaking to all of the saved on that day. A number of years ago, before I got into um, <laughs> to me, full-time full -time ministry is sort of like a contradiction in terms. We're all supposed to be ministers of the gospel. Not just somebody who gets paid to do it, not somebody who, because they're supported, can do it full time. Um, I admire my brother Andy so much because back when he was farming, even more so when he went into insurance, and then it really kicked into high gear when he went to work with Child Protective Services, he started reaching out to people and helping people and praying for people and bringing people to church, people he didn't know, people that were new to him, first time he met them, they were strangers, he was a stranger to them, but he started doing all this stuff, and he was not paid, he wasn't a designated evangelist or missionary or whatever, he was just a regular guy, just like y'all are regular guys and, and ladies, just regular folks. When I realized that God wanted me to do something. It, it's, a, it's a kind of an interesting situation. Oh, goodness, this was 35 years ago, maybe. Um, I was, uh, I think I was still working in real estate at the time. I had been farming, working on the farm with Andy and, and Daddy, and then I went into real estate. <clears throat> and I remember, I'll never forget, it was a Sunday after worship service, right here at Bridge Avenue, and we were down there in the fellowship hall, and, and it was one of those Sundays we were having a meal after the service. And everybody was, I mean, all the food was laid out. Everybody was gathered together. Of course, everybody was, you know, chatting and talking and, and, and laughing and, and everything. And honestly, I mean, confession, I was hungry, okay? I wanted to eat. And nobody was making a move. I mean, I knew we needed, somebody needed to say a prayer for us to be able to get started eating. But nothing was happening. And I went and... I'm pretty sure Bill was an elder at the time. I think I went and asked him, and he said, well, I, I think elder, uh, Delbert's going to say the prayer. And I went over and asked Delbert, and Delbert said, no, I think so and so is going to say the prayer. And, and so I went around, and, and everybody was thinking everybody else, somebody else was going to say the prayer for us to be able to get started. And I was hungry. I wanted to eat, okay? I'm, it's confession, okay? This is a carnal introduction to ministry for me. And um, 
And I just remember thinking at the time, who's running this show? Who's leading this, you know? And not like Bill wasn't doing his job, or Delbert his, or whoever was the minister at that time. I, I don't even remember. Uh, I, I should. I'm sorry. Forgive me if you see this. <laughs> uh, um, but it was a real eye-opener for me. It was like I was the one that God was tapping on the shoulder, you know, messing with my belly and saying, let's get this thing going, you know. I mean, I'm sure there were other people who were hungry, and we were just all waiting for somebody to lead that prayer. And so somebody, I don't know, I think maybe Delbert turned to me and said, why don't you lead it? And so I guess I led the prayer. Anyway, we went ahead and ate, and, and that's always stuck with me. It, it, was, uh, it was an eye-opening moment, and then there were more after that in which I realized um, I could actually be used by God to do something. And, and it was about that time that a brother tapped me on the shoulder when I was racing out the door uh, and asked me if I wouldn't mind teaching the teen class, and I gave him one excuse after another, Art, 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 what was Art's last name? Art Booth, Art Booth. yeah. Good old Art Booth, goodness. Um, and, and so I told him, Art, I don't really know the Bible very well. And he said, well, I can help you with that. And, and you know, come over to my place. I'll help you prepare uh, the lesson. And, he, and, and then I was like, well, I, I don't have any experience teaching. And he was like, well, you got to start somewhere, you know. And, and so I made one excuse after another. And I probably told you this story before. But anyway, at the end of it, I just said, well, what, isn't, you know, what about so-and-so? Well, they're going on vacation. Well, what about so-and-so? Well, he's been teaching for six months now. He needs a break. And so it was like there was nobody left to do the teaching. I was last in line. I, I was his last option, you know. And uh, so, I, I mean, it just hit me. Well, I'm better than nobody, okay. I never thought of myself teaching a class. And that class led to more classes and then some occasional preaching. And I was scared to death the first time I preached. It was over in Raymondville, as a matter of fact. Ronnie Wheeler. Wheeler. He got me. Oh, that guy was sharp. Called me up. I was in, I was still selling real estate at the time. I was in my office. He called me up. I think it was on a Friday. And he was, he had to go out of town on something. It was kind of a last minute thing. And, and again, you know, well, what about Bill? Well, Bill's preaching over here. Well, blah, blah, blah. And there was nobody. I mean, it was me. So I finally said, I said, Ronnie, I've never preached before. And he said, you'll do fine. And so I, you know, I said, okay, all right, I'll do it. And he said, great, okay. Uh, you're also teaching the class that morning, and then you preach Sunday night. And I was like, thanks, gee, okay. Well, it was a baptism by fire? I don't know. It was, uh, I, I was up all night, literally, uh, preparing a sermon, a class, and then another sermon for the evening. I think I finished the sermon for the evening that afternoon. Um, I had no experience. I was a complete introvert. I was not an outgoing person, despite the fact that I was selling real estate, which I was terrible at because I just didn't have a way to talk to people. And uh, Andy kind of, you know, confessed to that himself when he, at mom's memorial service, talked about how he was so shy, he couldn't even talk to a girl that he saw at church that he was interested in. I can tell you, my brother is an introvert. He's just like me. I mean, we grew up on a farm out in the middle of nowhere. It's nobody to talk to, okay? We didn't have a lot of experience. And we still don't. But there's something we do have, which is Christ saying, that person needs somebody to sit down beside him and pray with him. He's not going to church anywhere. Why don't you... Invite him to tell him about this garden that you've got out there. Those kids over there, they're not going to church anymore. Why don't you invite him to come to church on the bus? And we're, we're, we're not real good at it, but we hear God saying, there's a need. And, you know, I don't have much, but I'll bring what I've got. Um. Everybody, it's like me that Sunday, everybody thinks somebody else is in charge. And, and I get where you're at. You think, oh, look at Dennis. Oh, he's this missionary and stuff. I'm not that good at it, okay? I never was. I, I'm better today than I was. And Andy's not that great of an evangelist, okay? But he's doing the best he can with the tools that he's got. 
And I always thought the elders, the ministers, somebody else was better qualified to preach, teach, serve, help. And, and what I didn't realize, and as I got into ministry and began to listen to elders and preachers and, and evangelists, they were just like desperate because they're just overwhelmed. They can't reach all the people. They can't help all the needs that there are. They're seeing them, but they can't do it all. So no matter how poor or <laughs> weak or unprepared you may think you are, I guarantee you God can use you and wants to. All he wants you to do is just see that need and do it. Get involved, connect, serve, volunteer. Um, Martin, uh, I, was, I was out here yesterday. Andy had invited a young man by the name of Martin and his family to come to the, the, the community garden that he started over here. Um, Talking to Andy afterwards, I said, where did you meet Martin? He said uh, he was my physical therapist. Okay. I don't know what Martin's uh, spiritual situation is. I, I don't know if he's going to church somewhere. Uh, but I do know that he's, uh, he's been coming down here to the garden and helping Andy out and bringing his family with him. He was out there with his three daughters yesterday. And, uh, and they're just you know, just a few feet from the church building. And who knows, uh, you know, maybe as things begin to open up, may have some other folks from the church out there in the garden who can talk with Martin and visit with him and connect with him. And who knows, maybe someday he and his family start coming to church here in Westlake or going somewhere else. Or, or maybe just realizing, I need more of Christ in my life. That's kind of the whole idea of it. You're shy, you're insecure about your knowledge of Scripture, you don't know what to say, you don't even know where to start. Do you want to help people get to heaven? Do you want to see more people in that line on the right on that day? Do you want to be used by God to save souls? Do you want to be on Jesus' right among the sheep on that day? Ask God for help. Put yourself before him and just say, I don't know what you can do with me. I feel so useless, but I want to be used by you. I want to see those people that only I am going to see. And I want to know what I can do to help them. Tell him that. Pray that to him. Even today, I'm going to lead a prayer before we finish in that way. And, and ask Carrie, ask Andy, tell Bill, hey, I want to do more. I want to serve more. I want to help more. Point me in the right direction. Give me something to do. Tell him you'd like to get involved in door knocking, visitation, the bus ministry. Tell him you want to help out with the community garden. My brother is 70, what? 72? 71? 72? Yeah, March is coming up. Yeah. I'm, I'm knocking on that door. Uh, bus ministry, garden. It's not going to be very much longer before he's not going to be here to kind of head up those, uh, those forms of outreach. There's a need now for other folks to get involved, to roll up their shirt sleeves, to say, I can help. What, what can I do? I guarantee you, when he started doing what he's doing today, he had no clue about how to do it. But he said, God, I'm here. And God said, good, I can work with you. <laughs> and he has. And he'll do that with you. Just like I had no idea what I was doing when I went to Brazil as a missionary but it was just putting one foot in front of the other and keep on going and he'll show you and he will use you. If you ask Jesus for that heart, 
that spirit, that yearning for the lost, the needy, the hurting, he'll give it to you. He'll help you see the needy around you and show you how to help them. And one thing I can promise you, <laughs> as I stand here today, and I'm a little nervous. I'm, I'm always a little nervous, I guess, especially when I preach back home. I, I don't know why. I, I, I can sit in front of it. You'll see in the video, we, uh, the, the church that uh, I'm most a part of, in uh, Recife, we meet in a public park. Uh, we sit on a big concrete slab. It's got some columns and a little, uh, little low thing you can sit on around it. And um, we have 70, 80, sometimes 100. Uh, some of them are homeless. Some of them are people from slums in the downtown area. They just show up. And we have a little worship service. Uh, we sing two or three songs. We have a prayer. I share a message. Uh, we have another prayer, and we serve breakfast. Um, I feel just completely at home amongst those people. I, I don't feel the least bit nervous. I don't feel, the reason I feel, the only times I feel nervous is if a fight starts out or somebody shows up drunk and passes out in the middle of the thing, which happens, not often, but happens. Um, and so I get a little bit nervous about the order of things, but um, for the most part, I'm okay. And God got me there. I, I would have been scared to death when I first went to Brazil to do something like that. And now I'm just like, hey, this is church. These are my people. <laughs> These are Jesus' people. So any shyness, insecurity, doubts, whatever is keeping you from seeing and helping the needy, I promise you, it, it won't go away in an instant. It won't go away in a flash. But it'll dissipate with time. And, and a passion will grow within you to serve these people, to help these people that I promise you, you've never felt anything like this before. It is something, it will bring so much joy to your life, so much meaning to your life. You, you won't even have to think about what, the judgment day is going to be right, and whether you're going to be on the left or the right, you are going to, you're going to know. And you, you're going to know who's going to be there with you. And, and you're going to see some of the people who are going to be there with you because you saw them and reached out to them, and Jesus did all the rest. God will do that. God will use you. He wants to. Uh, he did it with Andy. <laughs> He's done it with me. Whoa, uh, I could tell you some stories about Dennis Downing. Hmm. Ran into a teacher years ago. I'd been in Brazil for a couple of years and, and um, was already doing mission work down there. Ran into a teacher that knew me when I was in uh, junior high and I guess high school. Uh, and, and she asked me what I was doing and I said I was... Uh, living in Brazil, serving as a missionary. She laughed so hard. She thought I was pulling her leg. And <laughs> I mean, re seriously, she had a big laugh. And, 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 and then she said, no, seriously, no, what are you doing? <laughs> and I said, uh, I'm a missionary in Brazil. She laughed so hard again. I'm, I'm not, I will never forget this scene. And uh, I mean, it's like tears were rolling down her eyes. And she asked me a third time, she said, no, seriously, Dennis, what are you doing now? And I said, I live in Brazil and I teach people about Jesus. And she, I mean, honestly, she was just in shock. Uh, she, just, she just looked at me and it just, it's, she just sort of blurted it out. And, and she, there, there was no meanness in it. She didn't mean, I mean, it, it sounds kind of mean, but she didn't mean it that way. She just said, you're the last person I would have ever imagined would be doing something like that. That's who Dennis was. I ain't that Dennis anymore. He changed me. And if he can do that much change in my life, goodness, you're, you're already so close to him. You're already walking along with him. He's going to do incredible things in yours. And there's a lot more to come. And there's a lot more lost people around us that we need to be reaching out to and taking advantage of the opportunities that we've got. 
And, and again, I'm, I am so thankful to God. And, and, and I'm, don't get me wrong. I, it's not like I see this church as like, you know, frozen in time and nobody's doing anything. Goodness, Andy and I, we, have, we are so grateful to God for his church here at Bridge Avenue and the way that y'all served our family for so many years and the expressions of love and devotion, the acts, the things you did for mom and Andy and me. Um, and I'm just saying there's more and, and there, there's more like mom out there. Uh, <laughs> They're our neighbors. They work in the shops we buy stuff in. They're our co-workers. Um, let's ask God for his heart uh, to see them the way he sees them and for him to show us what we can do to help them. And I guarantee you he'll do it. He's, he, he would love to do it. So thank you so much for your attention. And uh, as always, we want to extend the invitation. There might be somebody who's, uh, maybe there's something you need to repent of before the Lord and you want to ask for prayers. Maybe uh, you want to turn your life over to Christ. Maybe you've never been baptized before. I don't know what the need might be. And, and it doesn't have to be right now. I, I mean, for years I, was, I, I, I would hear the invitation and I would just sometimes I'd be shaken in my boots or my tennis shoes wanting to do something but just not having the courage to come down front in front of everybody. So this isn't like the only time during the week when you can do it, okay? Uh, when I was baptized, uh, I called up the brother that baptized me, Jerry Pyle, and it was a Saturday and he met me down here and he baptized me, just the two of us. And... As far as I know, that baptism was as valid as any one that happens on a Sunday with everybody watching. Okay, it's, uh, it, this isn't the only time, but this is a time, and we want to extend the invitation. And Sebastian, I, I think you probably got a song for us. Uh, I'll let you get on up here now. And So if you need any help, if there's any need you have, Bill, Carrie, uh, there's other brethren here that can help you.